Hello again friends, so today I hope we have a fairly interesting video because we're starting with a fairly exotic reagent in white phosphorus and this is really a follow on video from my um, main channel video over on explosions and fire where I sort of had a bit of a experiment with some white phosphorus, I blew some up, that sort of general white phosphorus video but in there I, I sort of explained that on exposure to UV light uh, my white phosphorus tends to convert back into red phosphorus. A room temperature exposure to light is, is quite easy to do and in that video I, I, I'll show the time lapse now and it's, it's not a great time lapse to be honest but you can see this lump of white phosphorus in here is distinctly orange. The idea really for this video is to try and really push this conversion all the way to actually get some nice red phosphorus powder from these lumps of white phosphorus. We can see we've had quite a conversion from the outside of this lump of white phosphorus but obviously it's just the outside because once that red phosphorus forms no more of the white phosphorus from the inside can continue to convert. So really we need a, a way, really a solvent to dissolve the white phosphorus and that will allow the UV light to come in and polymerize the phosphorus which turns into the red phosphorus chains. The red phosphorus will drop out of the solvent that'll be continuous so we'll, we'll be able to get complete conversion of the white phosphorus that way. Choosing a solvent isn't that hard because white phosphorus is actually soluble in most non-polar solvents. The common solvent for white phosphorus is carbon disulfide which I don't have. It's ideal because it dissolves a lot of white phosphorus per amount of solvent. It's got a high solubility in, in carbon disulfide and also the carbon disulfide doesn't react with UV in any way. And, and there's literature on this. We're following a literature paper from the late 1800s. Carbon disulfide is referred to as carbon bisulfide and white phosphorus is referred to as ordinary phosphorus because those were the times and red phosphorus was the exotic one because they could produce white phosphorus fairly easily but no one really understood where red phosphorus came from. Weird time period. Instead of carbon disulfide, which I don't have, we could choose benzene and in the phosphorus video I did use benzene to dissolve some white phosphorus up. However, because of the aromatic structure of benzene, it actually absorbs a lot of UV light. So, if the solvent is dissolving the UV light, absorbing the UV light doesn't dissolve the light, it absorbs the light, then the light isn't actually passing on to our phosphorus. So this is not a really good solvent for what we want to do. Also, the fact that it's flammable really sort of increases the safety risk of this sort of doing, you know, very, very flammable pyrophoric stuff in a very flammable solvent. A little bit risky. So instead, we're going to jump to chloroform. Chloroform has the advantage of being non-flammable and also doesn't really absorb a lot of UV light. However, it has a disadvantage that on exposure to air and UV light, it apparently turns into phosgene. And we can fight this by limiting the exposure to air, which we have to do anyway to stop the white phosphorus from exploding into flames, and also stabilizing it with a little bit of ethanol. Um, which shouldn't really affect the solubility of the white phosphorus that much because we don't have to add that much ethanol. I don't have heaps of chloroform in there, really not much at all, but there should be enough that it'll dissolve some white phosphorus, that white phosphorus will fall out as red phosphorus, and then more will get dissolved. So we'll get a bit of a cycle going until we get all converted into red phosphorus. Well, that's the idea anyway. Yeah, look at the colour difference between the two. Got one really orange one that's been in the sunlight a lot and one that's it's had a bit of sunlight but not that much. It's really been protected so. We also have a stir bar in there, Just we're not going to be stirring it the whole time but um, occasionally it'll be good to stir it up I think. So we've got one in there. Right, the big advantage of chloroform, why we're not using DCM, even though DCM is a lot more accessible for me, apart from the fact that white phosphorus will be more soluble in chloroform, but only slightly, I guess, is the fact that a chloroform boils at 60, oh, this is testing me, 60 something or other, um, but white phosphorus melts at 44 degrees. So with some degree of safety, we can quite reasonably melt the white phosphorus underneath the chloroform, which is something we can't do with DCM but this water is about 50 degrees. Yeah, see, it's liquid now. 
The idea here is to try and break it into lots of chunks so we don't have to keep it molten the whole time but it'll uh, go and dissolve a lot faster when it's all in little bits of ch chunks or perhaps even it might all dissolve in this amount of chloroform not quite sure and the solution has taken on a real milky appearance all right so this is our solution after we've heated it up and cooled it back down so the white phosphorus is now a solid it's very orange at the bottom here it's this big sort of one long smear of it on the bottom and a few loose chunks from the color of the solution you can tell that most of it has dissolved um so i'll let it stir for a little while but then for the other couple of hours of sunlight today i think we'll just um clamp it and just leave it in this direct sunlight it's a very good day for it today there's not not a cloud in the sky once again it's a beautiful autumn day here uh, it's not too hot but blazingly sunny all right it's had about five hours of direct sunlight today the light's failing and i think we've made real good progress today you can see it, um, before it was kind of a transparent yellow solution but now there's definitely an orange powder getting whipped around in there uh, i think we have a long way to go still and I won't be home at all tomorrow, but I'll, I'll leave it out just in the sun and clamp so it doesn't go walk about. It won't be stirring, but uh, next time we check in, it'll have another sort of uh, 10 hours of sunlight on it. All right, we're here on the end of the third day. I didn't actually get any sun on the second day because I forgot to put it outside. You see we have some great progress, so it's been on its side. And you can see up the top there, there's heaps of the red phosphorus. And you can see the difference. So you can see uh, the, the sort of the line there where the second day has... um really put an extra layer of phosphorus on and turned it that proper sort of red phosphorus color as opposed to that the top section there was sort of the uh, red phosphorus deposits from the first day it just really sort of yellowy and when a lot more is deposited on we get this really good characteristic red phosphorus color so uh, I've just been cleaning glassware today from my last experiment so this is not even close to all of it so um, they're just drying in the sun after being washed with ethanol so all right, we're on to day four now. I think it's day four, and uh, it's another shockingly sunny day. Uh, although it's pretty hot to do anything else, it's about 34 or something, so it's not really pleasant, but it's good for the reaction. We can see the reaction's really getting thick with the suspended solid now, which is real great. All right, I forget which day we're up to, um, but it's looking good, looking better every day. Apparently gonna rain tomorrow, so I'm hoping that today might be its last day. It's very windy today. Um, but still lots of sun. We actually have a cloud in the sky today though, so it's going to um, put it on a hot water bath again and do the, the melting thing and uh, give it a stir just to make sure any lumps of white phosphorus are exposed and um, melted up. And The time has come for us to open up the container and dump out the contents. I'm going to ditch it out into some toluene uh, rather than just drying it from the straight chloroform. And I've kind of been dreading this day for a little while. It's for a reason I don't think I've explained much yet with this video and it's the catch of this experiment and that's the toxicity. Uh, white phosphorus is a very toxic substance. It's got a toxicity of about one milligram per kilogram of body weight in terms of a lethal dose and that's sort of an oral, you know, if you eat it. You know, while that toxicity is extremely, extremely high, it's kind of hard to be exposed to it because it's really not that volatile and as a solid, of course, you can't really, it's hard to spill that across, you know, your hands or something like that. And even if you do, because it's so sort of non-polar, it's not going to, um, go through your skin that easily. Actually being poisoned by white phosphorus sort of involves like eating it or having a burn on you or something like that. However, we managed to dissolve 320 milligrams of white phosphorus in a less than 10 mils of chloroform. That increases the danger substantially because we now have chloroform which as uh, a liquid can transport quite easily through the gloves that I have. So it makes the exposure to the white phosphorus that's dissolved in there much, much more easier. And of course, with a concentration of white phosphorus like that, we're talking, you know, two and a half, three mils can kill me. Um, and you know, and even a lot less than that has serious health repercussions in terms of doing serious damage to my body. So we really don't want to spill it. And you know, my gloves don't offer that much protection. And you know, and that's without 
you know, mentioning the phosgene. I'm not sure if all the white phosphorus has been converted, I can't tell. So what we're going to do is we're going to just dilute it in a whole lot of tolu toluene, which will um, dilute it, yeah, and, well, I mean, it'll stop it bursting into flames, because if we tried to um, dry it directly from the chloroform and there is leftover white phosphorus, it could just burst into flames once all the chloroform is gone, uh, and that'll burn away all of our hard-earned work, which we don't want. So I'm going to get some toluene. We're using toluene because I have a lot of it and it's cheap. Everything is still in the tiny vial because as soon as I opened the lid, it started smoking. And uh, that tells us that there's still a lot of white phosphorus in solution. Well, maybe not a lot, but some. I took a little sample out just because it was, it was so orange. It was starting to worry me how orange it was. It's a flammable solid that's insoluble in water and um, is non-pyrophoric. Once we've washed it with, I washed it with toluene and then took a little bit out of that and put it in the methanol here. So um, once you do that, it's non-pyrophoric. But yes, we'll just leave it for a little bit longer. I cleaned off the sides a little, so hopefully uh, it should get back to a good production rate. Yeah, we're, we're done now. Even if it smokes, we'll, we'll uh, call it quits. Instead of toluene, this time we have some sodium hydroxide solution, which will react with any white phosphorus and uh, dissolve it away. And also it should react with the chloroform and uh, take that away. So we should, don't, don't just have a layer of dissolved white phosphorus at the bottom. Everything should react and just leave us with the, the red phosphorus. And, and this is advantageous because, you know, it's not going to burst into flames. Like the beaker full of toluene could have just burst into flames at any moment if a little bit of white phosphorus had like dried on the side or something like that. So at least there's this way, really a lot less chance of fires, which is, um, you know, good risk mitigation. Right, it looks it looks good, but um, we are going to let this react far away from uh, any human life, because uh, quite frankly, it, it smells like white phosphorus. Dreadful, genuinely dreadful. So it shouldn't burst into flames because of all the water, but this is turning out to be a very unpleasant experiment. So unfortunately, we've had a bit of a development. You can see the color of the solution is a lot less red than it was before, and there's hardly any solid in there at all. That leads us on to the, the, the bad thing and what, what appears to happen to all of our solid uh, and why we're so back is it all appears to have been converted into phosphine gas. We'll have to revisit this in um, a couple of days, I guess. All right, so we're here three months later and uh, this is the solution we're left with. Full of shit because uh, in the three months I got very annoyed with it because um, not only did the experiment fail but it actively tried to murder me. And uh, over that time I got some dirt and shit in it. But one thing that's very clear is that there's no phosphorus in there at all, red phosphorus or otherwise. There's no chloroform and there's some crystals at the bottom here which I assume are phosphate or either uh, formic acid. So, so it went clear like this with uh, no sort of suspension of particles at all within within an hour really of adding the phosphorus to the sodium hydroxide solution. So this is what we started with, white phosphorus. It's got the properties that it's soluble in chloroform and it's reactive to sodium hydroxide solution. And what we're trying to turn into is this polymerized form, the red form that's insoluble in chloroform and inert to sodium hydroxide. I say inert because it's actually really quite unreactive. The typical purification for, um, if you've got some red phosphorus with a little bit of white phosphorus and you want to purify it, reflux sodium hydroxide solution for more than 24 hours. So it's not like slightly unreactive, it's, it's completely inert to um, reacting with sodium hydroxide. So those two properties are very quite distinct. And what happens, and this is a very simplified view, but you can see there's that yellow bond there, this is the uh, white phosphorus tetrahedron, and it polymerizes. So what we have is that yellow bond um, breaking 
and then forming um, you know linked tetrahedrons but really it's so much more complicated than that and I think that's why we've ended up with a, a very distinct product what I'm calling it here is activated red phosphorus <laughs> got the property that is insoluble in the chloroform but it's still highly reactive to sodium hydroxide. It, it reacted very quickly. Really, I couldn't find anything theoretical to uh, suggest what was happening, and I, I've been looking in the literature quite a bit. So this is really quite purely speculation. But if we had a very, very poor polymerized product, which is something we have here because it's, it's you know, it's room temperature conditions, um, and we're just using UV light. So we're not gonna have a perfectly polymerized product. We're gonna have a real shit polymerized product. You know, it's been we're going to be riddled with defects. It's going to have, you know, white phosphorus tetrahedron in there as well, and they're sort of shittily linked. So it's polymerized enough to take on the color and also drop out of solution. But because of all the defects and how badly it's polymerized, it still retains its activity towards sodium hydroxide. And that really that really kills the synthesis because I can't see a way of avoiding this sort of material because we're doing it at such a low temperature and really this sort of polymerized thing should occur at high temperatures to make sure that you know it's complete and we don't have that many defects. I, I don't think converting white phosphorus into red phosphorus using sunlight is a valid synthesis. It just it's not going to give you a good product. There's a great video by Nux Vomica, if I'm remembering that correctly, um, and he does the white red synthesis in a more conventional manner, which is um, heating the white phosphorus, uh, you know, w without exposure to air, of course, and also a little bit of sodium iodide as a catalyst, and that converts it into really, really nice red phosphorus. Completely different to what we have here, which is terrible red phosphorus. Also, I didn't die. That that's a good success. It was a lot of phosphine that <laughs> was produced, and um, once again, it stresses the importance to me. It was a bit of a wake-up call, you know, that sometimes things go completely differently than even what you theoretically could predict. Thanks for watching, and um, I'll see you around.